Hi everyone, I'm Sam. Uh, I already feel like I've told my story to, uh, to 100 people over the last uh, day and a half. Um, so for the rest of you, uh, hopefully I tell a consistent story. I've got a few who are going to pop up and say, no, you're wrong. Um, I'm the founder of an ed tech startup called Notifier, uh, which was sort of inspired by, by two things. Uh, the first was that, at least in New Zealand, and this is a, a global trend, um, so we've got a growing gap between high achieving and, and low achieving students and, and more and more slipping through the, the right hand, and hand tail of the education system. Uh, and the other bit is, is I grew up with a sister who has cerebral palsy. So I saw firsthand the effect of, of having a physical and, and, and learning disability uh, going through the education system. So that sort of sparked my curiosity from that. And, and, and my background before starting Notifier was helping startups um, early stage teams build the first and second iteration of their product. So I thought, how can I apply this in the education sector? And I, I spent a year uh, surrounding myself with what's going on, understanding the problems, um, and even teaching classes in, in um, intermediate and high schools. So uh, that be elementary, um, sorry, middle and, and middle and high schools, uh, for the Americans in the room. Uh, and we, we started picking apart what is a successful student. Um, and as a result of that, what, what's a successful classroom and successful teacher? Uh, and what we found with teachers is that, yeah, there's a lot of things going on, but what a successful teacher does more than, than somebody who, who uh, isn't put up on a pedestal is they check in with their students more often. They ask them what's going on. And because of that whole culture of, of checking in, um, they're able to experiment, try new ideas and initiatives. Uh, so we sort of started looking at, well, how can we productize this? How can we make it easier for, for any teacher and anybody actually in an education organization to, to check in with their people more often? And that's, that's how notifiers come about. So the journey's sort of gone a year since then. We've, we've um, launched in, in India last month. We're about to go live in, in Singapore and Dubai this month with a few schools. Uh, and what we're seeing now that more people are checking in is there's all of this data within these organisations, and it's probably not a good follow-on uh, to talk about <laughs> education data, um, but we're able to see what's working and what isn't on the ground, and we're able to see what makes champions, whether that's staff, students, or in education, um, non-profits, volunteers. Uh, and because of all of that, we can now focus our, our PD training better. Um, we can try and replicate the success throughout an entire organisation. So that sort of sums up um, my journey with Notifier so far, and, and, and why I'm passionate about education, and I'll let someone else uh, talk about something totally different. Hello, I'm Brienne West. Um, I've been self-employed starting several business since I was eight years old. Um, the first being a pet detective agency, which was pretty cool. Um, <laughs> and we did find a cat, too. Anyway, um, and the, sort of the, the, first, the first two real businesses I started, um, I started when I was 19 and still in university, and it was more out of a distaste for working for anyone else and being told what to do. Um, it, it, it was kind of a hobby for uh, probably four years or so, um, and I, I lost interest quite quickly in both of them. Um, they didn't have any point beyond selling a product. Um, so, yeah, I lost interest very quickly. I sold them both, um, went back to university and, and pondered what I wanted to do. My passion is the environment and animal welfare. Um, and I, I think the way we treat both is horrific. And I wanted to do something measurable, something that I had experience in that would have an actual impact. So I thought, I, I, know, I know the cosmetics industry because that was one of my previous businesses. Um, how can I make it different? And the answer was getting rid of water, which might seem odd. But my company, Atik, we're now three years old, we produce solid cosmetics, so solid shampoo, solid conditioner, uh, self-tanning bars, pretty much everything you would use in your bathroom, we have a solid version for it. We do that because we don't have to have plastic bottles, we don't have to have water, and often we don't have to have preservatives. We have thus far saved 50,000 bottles from going to the landfill or recycling facility, which is arguably not any better. Um, and we, we just um, we package it in card compostable cardboard packaging without any laminates, without any chemical um, coatings or anything, so it is actually compostable. Um, yeah, so 
it's, we've just produced a waste-free product. We're also um, a certified B Corp, and um, for all you Wellingtonians out here, I don't believe there's any Wellington-based certified B Corps, which is, you need to work on that. <laughs> because there's five in Christchurch. Um, yeah, so that's my little social enterprise, yeah. Hi, I'm Dimitri uh, from Auckland, originally from Soviet Union slash Russia. Um, the three things on my card are universal access, brains plus computers, and social enterprise. And I get to do all three or work on all three in a venture called Thoughtwired that I started several years ago with a couple of other people where we are developing a thought-controlled communication tool for people who are locked in and unable to speak because of physical disability. So an overused example would be Stephen Hawking, uh, but actually there are thousands and thousands of people in situations way worse than uh, Dr. Hawking um, who have a functioning mind but are locked into the bodies that uh, don't function. Um, the way it works, uh, we use um, devices like this. This is a headband that has a couple of electrodes on it. Um, it goes on a person's head and reads the brain activity that our brains produce um, and turns it into signals. We then use our software and guiding practices that we develop to teach people how to produce certain types of brain activity. Uh, that would follow patterns, um, and then that person would produce those patterns at will uh, when they want to perform an action, like press a virtual button on the screen or simply say yes or a no. Um, so that's, in essence, what uh, we're doing. We are still uh, pre-market, uh, so we're still developing this product. Uh, we're aiming to get to version one uh, by the end of this year, provided that uh, we uh, attract the funding that we need to get there. Um, and yeah, in that version one, a person uh, will be able to say yes or no reliably, which is going to be a huge um, step forward for um, several hundred of people in New Zealand and many thousands uh, overseas, where at the moment they either have no ability to communicate or they rely on low-tech methods uh, which often have an accuracy close to chance, where it's basically you're trying to say something and you have a 50-50 chance that you'll be understood. Uh, the reason I got into this, I'm not a neuroscientist, um, one reason was that I have a younger cousin who is uh, completely paralyzed and locked in because of uh, severe cerebral palsy. Uh, and the other was because I was procrastinating at uni um, and I came across a video of one of these devices, or a more complicated one, that showed that you can read a person's brain activity and turn it into um, useful data. And I kind of put the two together, got an um, unhealthy amount of encouragement from people, and uh, here I am. <laughs> hey, everyone. I'm Bonnie. Um, so I've always been incredibly passionate about a lot of things, and I am two years out of high school. And quite often this passion would come out, well, it did come out in work volunteering for big NGOs, like UNICEF, World Vision, and that was an awesome stepping stone. Um, and now I live and work in Wellington, working a little with the Inspiral crew, but mostly on my startup, Indigo and Iris. And Indigo and Iris is a sustainable makeup company with the mission of curing treatable blindness in the Pacific Islands. Um, so we're pre-launch as well, but the idea is that we're going to give all of our profits to funding eyesight restorative surgeries in the islands and funding scholarships for Pacific Islanders to study ophthalmology and nursing. Um, so my trigger point is what I wanted to talk about, and I wanted to talk about it quite honestly. So I came to Wellington for a nine-week course um, called Live the Dream, and basically you explore your passions and come up with a solution for a social problem. And I had no intention of going further than these nine weeks. Um, but I met this Wellington community, and a lot of you are actually in the room today. And for the first time in my life, I wasn't reminded of my age. I wasn't told to calm down and not make decisions at so young and like 
Um, in fact, it was the opposite. I was judged only by my actions and by the kind of person I wanted to be and the kind of person I am. Um, so, yeah, I'm incredibly passionate about changing the way the beauty industry speaks and treats women. Um, and I'm incredibly passionate about access to healthcare for everyone. But the thing that made me feel empowered and able to actually take action um, is this community and feeling like I'm valued and I'm heard and understood. Well, I don't know about you, but I mean, I can. I think I can sleep easier at night knowing that there's, <laughs> that there's people like this um, and, and through support in this room that we can the scale, the impact and numbers of younger, I've been told I'm not allowed to say young people, younger, <laughs> we had a chat earlier, <laughs> younger people. Um, so just, just on that point and, and speaking um, to what you were saying about, about age, so uh, Sam, you, you guys are like 19 and 20, right? 19 and 20. So um, just before we open up to questions, I'm just wondering, you know, do you see any specific challenges um, from being a younger person in the in the impact space, um, a double-edged sword there because I think there's there's always challenges in the impact space. Um, so it'd be silly to say they're they're unique or some of these are unique to young people. Uh, I guess the biggest challenge to being young is simply being young and not having spent as much time on this earth observing uh, this the social, um, environmental, and cultural. Uh, problems and issues um, that are going on. Uh, I get to see and, and, and help a lot of young people who are working on a variety of ideas. And we've opened up some space for them to, um, to come pick, uh, pick up the talent out of our team and, and, and um, be around, surround themselves with that. And, and what we see is that a lot of them haven't or have latched onto the externally facing problem and haven't, a lot of young people, at least starting off that I've seen, haven't delved deep into the why and they've started build or trying to build a solution um, for a problem that they haven't truly gone and, and understood the root cause for. Uh, and I think that that is part age and part experience. Um, that, that to me is the biggest challenge of, of being young. I'm not really that young anymore, but um, <laughs> I think um, Dimitri and I were discussing it earlier, and, and the biggest problem with being young is that you don't have the networks you do when you're older. Um, it, it, it's been integral to my success thus far that I've partnered with much older, slightly older, um, <laughs> <laughs> um, much more experienced, much cleverer people who have got these networks and these contacts and this experience, so that sort of balances out our weaknesses. Um, just another question that we talked about that we wanted to have a bit of a group discussion is if, you know, there's been a lot of talk this week, New Frontiers, about the creation of Incubation Nation and our individual and collective roles in, in doing that. Um, we had a discussion earlier is if we are going to truly create this Incubation Nation, we need to multiply and scale um, the numbers of people who are entering into this space of creating ventures for positive um, environmental and social change. So my question to anyone on the panel, and not necessarily all of you because the interest of time, um, is how can we encourage new people into this space? One thing that um, actually came out yesterday uh, in one of the breakout sessions was um, having some recognisable safety nets because um, really the having you know an idea or recognizing a problem is only one part of what lets you or sets you on a path of actually trying something. The other one, um, not for everyone, some people just go and do it regardless, but I think to encourage more people to try, um, we need these recognizable safety nets. Um, and it doesn't have to be you know that you get a chunk of money and you know a this ability to go and do something because of that but it's a, a, a very multi-dimensional thing it, it, it may be that you get some support that you can go and do that or even just more um, of intangible thing that actually it is okay to go try see what happens if you fail then 
you know, will help you out and set you on a path. Um, because, yeah, for me, it was my family and some of the other networks that I had that basically said, give it a go. Um, and, and that's what helped. Building off what Dimitri was, was just saying, I, I prefer um, working with people who have taken that first step, that first um, step towards creating some impact, and that, that's where I think they're ready. And I think as an incubation nation, uh, I'd prefer if we flipped that around and said, let's be an accelerator nation. Let's accelerate their personal growth and their venture or, or impact growth. Um, and I think, I, I look at what the definition of philanthropy is. Um, and, and one of those definitions that I really like uh, is simply being generous. And I look back at um, what was the, the generosity that was given to me and, and the greatest impact that, that's helped me grow myself um, has been simply people spending their time with me. And I've had some amazing mentors and some amazing supporters, one of whom's clicking their fingers at the front here, <laughs> Anna. Um, and they're the ones and you th that have probably influenced and, and uh, accelerated my growth and, and my ability now to, to scale what I'm working on. Cool, that's awesome. Um, you pretty much covered the third question that we had, which is the best means of scaling impact. But did, 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 did anyone else have anything to say on, as a country um, and as individuals in this country, what do you think the best means of scaling impact? Is it through supporting younger entrepreneurs or, or any uh, further thoughts? Um, I think the best way and the quickest way to um, create any kind of impact is through business, it doesn't have to be a younger entrepreneur obviously, but um, business has the, the reach, the money sometimes, and the, the, the lobbying power to get shit done. Sorry to come up again. Um, hogging the mic here, but I look at, um, again, what an entrepreneur is, um, and what an impact entrepreneur is. And I don't think they're that different. Uh, I think an entrepreneur or an entrepreneurial person by default is someone who, who cares about um, something that matters, whether it's this problem, this issue, this injustice. And they, the, the bit that makes them an entrepreneur is that they scale some sort of solution for it, right? So then if we look at what scaling a solution is, um, is that I think there's three really great vehicles for that, and one of them is business, that's a great means of scaling, but it's not the only one. And I know entrepreneurs, um, or entrepreneurial people as well, who don't have businesses, and one of them that instantly comes to mind is Sir Ray Avery. He didn't start off by creating a business, but he was able to scale his impact dramatically by operating um, within a, a wider environment. Uh, the other two vehicles that I think are really powerful is technology, um, and also models effect around people. If you can figure out a model around people and you look at um, social virality as um, one of them, uh, one way of spreading word of mouth, one way of, of spreading a message, that I think is the third big um, vehicle for, for scaling impact through entrepreneurship. Cool, awesome. Well, um, how about we give a big round of applause for these guys? Mm -hmm.